I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I'm joined again today by Diana Carter, the Executive Director of the nonprofit Brookings Core Response. Welcome back to the show, Diana. Hey, it's been a minute. It has been. It's actually it? been a minute this time. I don't I don't <laughs> even remember the last time I was on. No, it's been weeks. Yeah, it really has like been. months, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it might be. I know. Yeah. So you drove down from Gold Beach today. Yeah, it was super rainy. Yeah, tell me about that drive. Oh, was that interesting? I love driving in the rain. So, I mean, uh, uh, my windshield wipers were up to the max and yep. still could barely see, but I did hydroplane a few times. So <laughs> I think... 35, 40 miles an hour is probably the max you'd want to go in that condition. So, on 101. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And there was a tree um, right about mile marker, what is it, like 251 or something, which is, it's just north of Brookings. Uh-huh. Uh, there was a tree, oh, about six feet above the road, suspended by some power lines that had fallen over. So, so not It's great. wild out there. We, we called it in, said, uh, yeah, you know, did you guys catch a, a tree on 101? And they were like, yeah, we, we, we got it. And I'm like, at this location, though, because I'm sure there's more than one. Right, right. So, but they did. So they'll, they'll probably. Well, they know it. They know it's there, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean they yeah. fixed it yet, though, well, right? I'll see on my way back up if it's still there. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the rain is beginning. Daylight savings mm-hmm. time is ending. Yay, I love that. Oh, I hate it. An hour. I get to sleep in for an hour. <laughs> no, I like that part of it, but I don't like losing the light. Oh, I don't something. care. You get it in the morning. It's no, just... I don't because I'm asleep in the morning. Oh, right, because you're asleep in the morning. Well, I get it in the morning. There you go. I it's, guess... it's better for the school children. Yeah, probably. Because it's lighter in the morning when they're standing right. up for the bus because right. it, they actually, it actually shows that um, more accidents happen the minute daylight is it when daylight savings time begins that's when we spring forward right Mm -hmm. yeah so when daylight savings time begins there are more accidents um and and actually children are hit in the morning yeah because it's dark yeah so there's a some rhyme and reason but i wish that we would leave it this way like when it ends Mm -hmm. just leave it without daylight saving just we all sleep in an extra hour i mean it won't be like that but no. In my head, it will. Won't. Yeah. That's all that <laughs> in, matters. In your alternate yes. reality. <laughs> I live in cognitive dissonance when I can. As do we all. Yes. You have to at these I know, times. Right? <laughs> exactly. And I noticed that the Christmas decorations are coming out. Yeah. Always the day. Yep. November 1. Here we are. Unbelievable. Start those carols. <laughs> I, I actually just like the lights. I don't, we don't celebrate like Christmas traditionally. We right. don't do like big crazy stuff but boy there's something about the lights that i see them and they just make me happy i don't it's like those those well i was gonna say those childhood memories but some of those weren't great but maybe it's maybe that's some cognitive dissonance but yeah the the lights just make me really happy this time of year Mm -hmm. and i really like the carols yeah i do too even though i'm not very religious no i'm not either but i just i love singing them and i especially love singing them in harmony that's Ah, my favorite so you know, yeah. I, that sounds like our next podcast. We just sing carols. Singing in uh-huh. harmony. I, I was that. in choir. I could Were do you? it. Yeah. All right. For years. <laughs> yeah, we got this. However, I think that by the time I'm about a week out from Christmas, mm-hmm. I've heard enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. You've heard enough Mariah Carey? I've heard yeah. enough. <laughs> yes. So what I know about this time of year is that... The rain is like coming sideways. It's yeah. getting cold. Um, I I think I I think it's safe to say that you get your whole organization kind of ramps up yep. in this weather, right? Yeah, when everybody else is sort of uh, powering down for the winter and in hibernation and holidays, um, this is our busiest time. And it's not because it's when we get the most people. It's when people are most in crisis and most in need, especially people who um, are, like, new to homelessness. This is just the worst time and area to be new to homelessness, for sure. So we'll we'll get a lot of calls for support around this time of the year. And it's typically stuff that we can't help with, that most agencies can't help with, um, because it's sort of long-term uh, goals and, and problems that, you know, if we just jump in and do one thing here or there we it, you know we need we need stable housing we need shelter support we need long-term solutions we we do some intermittent um support you know we try to get tarps and tents and things and other agencies um also work on that but realistically like we we need that long-term 
the real support. All right. So this is a really difficult time of the year for us, for sure. So in previous years, you've had winter shelter. Mm -hmm. And winter shelter here looks like a motel mm -hmm. where you can... That's yeah. We've had up, right? we've had the most success with just renting out a section of a motel. I know some other agencies have done it differently. Um, the coalition, Adapt, I think um, even like DHS and the insurance companies and all that, and, and Oasis when they were here. There's a lot of agencies that try to utilize um, motels or different areas for support for various individuals, but we've had the most success with just literally renting out a, a chunk of a motel and um, using it for our program purposes. So what happens is we we rent out, we usually rent out half of a motel downtown and um, we give a, a set amount and then we're able to determine who goes in. So it's kind of like that becomes, we're like subleasing it. So mm -hmm. we, within reason, there's some people that are not allowed in, on certain locations, um, including that motel. And so if they're trespassed, we can't bring them into the shelter. But we usually have our own application process. We do everything ourselves. We have our own bedding that we supply the motel with. So we take over that section of the motel for, you know, typically it's six months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes we've been extended to nine months, which is great. Oh, wow, yeah. So six to nine months out of the year, we have a section of motel that we can do with, for the most part, what we need to mm -hmm. for our participants. And it kind of... Didn't it kind of start with COVID? Is it did start with COVID. Okay. Yeah, the uh, when the Oregon Health Authority took over our public health here, that I think it was actually prior to that that the funding came through. But it certainly came a lot more, uh, a lot faster, and a lot more direct once Oregon Health Authority was uh, directly funding us. Mm -hmm. But there was uh, public health funds that came through the state to provide shelter for people who don't have access to housing or don't have access to any other shelter. Um, and then if they, whether they needed a place to, you know, if they were sick, if they caught COVID and they needed a place to shelter in place for a week or two, they were allowed to be at that shelter. Um, and then we provided at pretty much everything they needed, meals, um, groceries, like personal items, if they had bills that they had to pay, like storage or something, we just, we covered everything so that they did not leave and did not, you know, cause any other uh, infection. So right. that was part of the use of the motel. The other part was for vaccine relief. So if they got a vaccine and they had a reaction to it, or if they got a vaccine, they just needed a place to be for a few days to get mm -hmm. through. I mean, some people had I had a significant reaction to it. I do too. Yeah. I'm down for three days. Yep. So I would definitely need to be somewhere where I could rest and drink mm -hmm. fluids because that's yep. how the vaccine is most effective is yes. you take care of your body while right. it's working. So that's that was another use. And then, and then they just allowed for actually uh, just some winter shelter use too. Mm -hmm. So we actually had an entire motel rented out that first year, most of which went to COVID patients and vaccine relief. And then some were just winter shelter. Uh, that was the first year. That was in 2020. And then we, ha we had 2021, uh, 2022, and then I guess 2023. Wow, it does not seem like this is our fifth year. It's hard to believe, isn't That's it? That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> How time flies when you're that having fun. Yes, right? that's what it is we're having. Um, yeah, I guess this will be our fifth year doing this. So, wow. yeah, we feel, you know, I obviously not, every, not all of my staff have been with me for the last five years, but some of them have experience outside of this doing shelter. But this is, you know, certainly something that I've been doing for, uh, this is not my fifth year doing shelter. This is my eighth year doing shelter because I did it previously in Jackson County through first as a well actually as a volunteer mm -hmm. through Rogue Retreat mm -hmm. for their winter shelter so that's where I got my feet wet but this uh, over here it's a little bit different you know our area is a little different so we we had to kind of learn the first couple of years mm -hmm. and Absolutely. now I mean now we've literally we can get this together in a week we're just waiting at this point for the state to give the thumbs up and we have so everything. do they have to do that every year do yeah they, they do. well it's, it's interesting because it's changed over the last few years. The funding streams have changed. You know, with our, our um, current governor, uh, Kotek, coming in, there were a lot of executive orders signed. There was also a lot of shift around through 
uh, Oregon Housing and Community Services, which is the housing branch of the state as opposed to the the health branch like Oregon Health Authority. Mm -hmm. So Oregon Housing and Community Services, there's been a lot of shift in them, positive shift. Now, I mean, certainly when you're speaking to the staff, they're very overwhelmed and there's a lot going on. You know, they're trying so hard to support all of us out here around the state doing the work, but they're also onboarding their own staff and expanding programs. And and some of those programs are changing names and and Mm -hmm. ordinances. So Mm -hmm. it's it's really a shakeup at the state when it comes to housing. And I think that we can say that that's happening on a federal level to some extent as well. That's why this is happening on the state level. But also just because, you know, Governor Kotek came into her position already having worked on homelessness issues. That's how I knew her from before mm. was when she was a legislator. You know, I spoke in support of several of her um, initiatives that she was taking through the legislation. So she's always been on the horn when it comes to housing. And I was really happy to see her come into the, the governor position. And she's signed multiple executive orders. So I guess, you know, long story short, the, the funding comes down through OHCS but it typically goes to a community action agency and they can sub that money out, sub grant the money out to agencies doing the shelter work. Mm-hmm. And then they take on the administrative burden. But they've actually had our community action agency here has had an, a, a capacity issue itself over COVID. And so there actually was an opportunity for us to be funded directly from the state through OHCS. And, and so last year was the first year we operated outside of um, our community action agency. Wow, that's great. Mm-hmm. And it went well. Oh, it was, yeah, it was lovely. They actually gave us the funds up front, so we were able to really, um, really just take care of everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then, of course, if you don't spend it all, you, you send back. I think this last shelter, um, they gave us a significant chunk because we're the only ones doing it this year, whereas last year the coalition was also involved. Um, so we got a significant chunk this year and we ended up, we max, we used every space we possibly could. So it wasn't a lack of, um, you know, our work on our part, but there was some funds unused and we hate that, but so we are sending back some funds to the state and then, and that's the 2023, 24. So we're just now wrapping all that up and we're heading into the next 2024 2025 oh, it just you yeah. get a very short break and and that break usually entails a lot of grant writing during that so right shelter is a full year program whether you run it all year or not it's just it requires a lot of energy and so this year again we're going to get funding directly from the state they awarded us the funds and we have one shelter open but it's just a house. It's just a smaller shelter. So what we asked if we asked if we could use the remaining funds to open a secondary shelter, and we're waiting for their we're waiting for their thumbs up right now. Um, but they had a lot of you know they wanted us to submit a new budget and all of that. And um, the awesome thing is because we've been doing it for so many years, I I can I can tell you how much money we need every month to run a shelter, um, even if we scale up. So oh, that's great. Yeah, it's. It's it's not a well-oiled machine, but it's an oiled machine. There so, we go. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting there. And I would think that the motel owner would be thrilled yeah. to have at least part of his motel. Mm-hmm. I think so. Built. I we I think we've had a. I mean, just personally, I I've had a good relationship with that motel owner and a couple of the of the different motels around here, but in particular, this motel owner has. Uh, wanted to support and has done a really good job of just being flexible with us while also, you know, protecting himself. Right. And so we've had a good relationship. We've been able to um, ensure on our end that, you know, first of all, we keep case management on site. This year will be different. We won't have case management on site. We'll have peer support on site. So we're, we're switching it up. We're not requiring case management for folks in there. We typically do require some engagement. That's not what we're asking this year. We're we're asking just um, our just our general rules, mm-hmm. is it? But we will offer case management. Mm-hmm. So that way, you know, there's some folks that they really don't need case management. They just need a place to land for a minute and then they get a job. They get I mean, we saw that last year and the year before, which is why we're moving towards this this model, because it was such a hot it was so much of our time for these requirements. And it, you know, some of those people were 
trying to shift meeting with us around their ske- their work schedule. And it was like, why are we why are making we even, them jump through yeah, hoops? They already have a job. Exactly. They're, they've got a place lined up. We, they just need a little right. um, a place to take a shower and land. Yep. Yeah. So so we're not requiring that because it really just doesn't make sense for everybody and for us. Uh, but we're still going to offer it. We'll offer it off site. That way, you know, that space is really just a space for them to be. Great. And doing that and providing all of their needs there, we have had such few um, difficulties with our shelter spaces because we provide a lot of staffing. We try to provide 60 hours a week of staffing on site. Um, And this year, like I said, it'll just be social emotional support. So Mm -hmm. even better. And then we provide meals. We provide all of their, for the most part, their finance needs. Um, So it'll be great to um, have that space for people to decompress. And I I hope the state gives me a quick thumbs up because we're every day we're looking for that email. And it's raining. (laughs) Yeah. I literally (laughs) looked through my email right before we jumped in here to be like, maybe they approved it now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we assume it will be approved because, you know, they they know how important this is and they know our capabilities of this. And it's also not more money I'm asking for. I'm just asking them to split the money. Right. So I think we'll be So good. once they do send you the email, how long will it be then yeah. until you can open it up? Well, it'll be pretty quick because we, you know, we've done this so many times now that we know what we need to bring in. Mm-hmm. We know how we need to set it up, and we know what the application process needs to look like. So when the state gives the thumbs up, I assume within the hour, Dave and Liz will know about that. Um, Dave's overseeing you know, everything, but Liz is really doing a lot of the hands-on work, getting set up. She's, uh, you know, worked, she had worked for a rogue retreat before, and she also was primarily the one that set up Pineview Cottage, which is the transitional shelter. So she's got a a lot of experience um, in the shelter work. And so her and Dave will be setting that up, connecting with the motel owner. We've got our motel up in Gold Beach with all, they just left all the supplies there. So for the first year, uh, we have like a whole motel's worth of supplies to bring in ourselves. We don't have to purchase any extra bedding. We don't have to do anything like that. We'll just grab what we have from up north and set up. So so it'll actually be a little quicker. Mm -hmm. Um, And then our application process you know, having several years of experience with this now, now we know what what's going to get us the quickest um, applications and get people in the quickest. And that is us doing it on site, in-house and opening up, you know, we'll probably open up several days initially to get as many applications as we can. Great. And then we'll have an ongoing application process. So it'll be first come, first serve. Um, we did, we tried to do some prioritization the last few years. And what we found was that it was just really hard to make those judgment calls. Yeah. We're not doctors. We're not, you know, we are social workers to some extent. And we know um, the people that we're working with for the most part. But it is so, uh, it's such a gray area to ask a case manager, you know, who out of the t- these two people who should get the room. So I wouldn't be able to answer. Oh, that. we've struggled. Yeah. We've struggled. And I we've done the best we could. We right. last year and the year before, I know we did the best we could to put people in that we felt were high priority. Mm-hmm. And and again, this year, um, I have told staff, if you have people you're working with that are high priority, you, you need to schedule appointments with them right. because this is first come, first serve. Mm-hmm. And so how many people will you be able to? house it depends we've submitted two plans to the state Mm -hmm. so plan a is 20 rooms up to 30 people Mm -hmm. actually it could be up to 40 people um and then even children if need be Mm -hmm. but we're assuming we probably won't have more than 30 at one time Mm -hmm. that was um we figure one and a half people per room you know that doesn't make sense but that's the that's what we average so that's what we're planning on averaging this year as well so if we get all 20 rooms that would be 30 plus individuals. Uh, plan B is we get 10 rooms like we have the previous years. So we're really hoping for the 20 because um, since we're not requiring the case management, uh, the staffing, the capacity issue won't be as big of a deal. And I requested funding for three full-time staff for this. Great. So we that's, that's another thing is that um, we're hiring right now for the Pineview Cottage, which is our transitional shelter. That is closed, though, so we're finishing interviews Monday, and we'll have a decision by then. And then we anticipate having two full-time positions open up soon for this shelter if we get the thumbs up. So what what does that bring your staffing level to? (laughs) Um, 
So right now Unless we are. Unless you've lost count. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I was actually thinking, I was trying to think if we're at, we're at 12 now, but when we hire next week, we'll be at 13. And then we'll have two more positions for our case managers for health programs that are, I could hire any time now. I just can only do so much at one time. So we'll have 15 staff. And then if we get the thumbs up, we'll have 18 staff for wow. the shelter. And then, yeah. And then we anticipate bringing in a biller as well because we're moving so far. So possibly by the end of the year, we might have 18 or 19 staff. It's a lot. It's a real lot. <laughs> yeah. It makes me laugh because I remember... I remember the beginning of this. Gosh, it seems like it was so long ago, but it really was not that long ago. I know. I know like, like three four, years ago, yeah, there was three yeah, of us yes. dinking around. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. It really is. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I wanted to just kind of underscore that I was thinking about last night is that the grant monies that mm -hmm. you are bringing into the community are coming into the community and helping mm -hmm. our whole community. And some of it's money that came from this community. Right. Like that Veterans Project up in Gold Beach, which is called Courage Lane Cottages. So that is 18 units of affordable housing for veterans. And by affordable, we mean low income, not just somebody's definition, but actual low income housing with set rates. And then we're hoping to provide vouchers to even lower the amount they're paying out of pocket um, so we can get some HUD funding from the federal government to come in and pay for these these veterans housing. Um, what a concept. <laughs> so, right. yeah. so that's what we're really hoping for, working with housing authority. Um, and and one, you know, it, it not just braids in funding uh, that comes into the community, but it but it helps the individuals as well. But but that is important to note that this is our money, this $3.2 million that we got for the project up there in Gold Beach, that's Curry County money that's been sitting up at the state for the last 30 years that we've not used. Oh, you're kidding. So this, is, this comes from a lot of our uh, the, the fees around here when people build. Uh -huh. Some of those fees go up to the state and go to the general fund. And I think Adam had said somewhere, it, we haven't had any of those funds used in Curry County in the last decade. And he did the calculations on that, and it's somewhere close to, I think he said, $600,000 that we've paid the state um, that hasn't been reinvested. So that this is us bringing that money back. This is this is Curry County residents' tax money coming back. That's great. So, um, because what happens is it comes in, and so you're, you're paying construction workers. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, all of We're the, bringing it back to, to reinvest. Exactly. Yeah. And so it pays these people's wages and it mm -hmm. pays your your employees' wages and they spend that money at Freddy's or at yeah. Bymart. And, or I mean, yeah. And we've had other agencies come in and be like, oh, we want to contribute resources from outside the community into this. Wow. We want to bring even more resources. So we've got Gold Beach Main Street that's going to be riding grants to get a pocket park then this will be one of the larger pocket parks for them it, it's we we're setting aside a significant chunk of the land over there um, and this will be community use which the the land itself does you know the property the project needs to be used for the residents so there's a community center that we built on it it's not actually for the community it's for the the, the residents community right, right. but this little pocket park is at the end right on 101 and it's our intention is for that to be used by the community. Right. So we're we're looking at having you know there's going to be a, a a little bronze statue with I think it's otters. It's adorable. Aww. And then there's going to be benches. There's going to be you know bike rack. I think is what they're looking at. There's several different great um, options they're looking at. But I I think they sent me the plans. So that's just one example of an agency saying, hey, we're going to bring in even more money to improve this space right here, improve the property, improve the function of the land, and improve downtown Gold Beach. Because right. one of one of the things that we talked about yesterday, or the day before yesterday, we went out with Gold Beach Main Street and did a walkthrough of the property. Um, we have that big sign out there that says Wild Chinook Inn that we'll be taking down. And they're going to be uh, hopefully helping us with that through grants. Um, and, and that doesn't seem like a big deal to anybody. But it is because those those tall, those big signs, when you can see them from a, a ways away, miles away, or, you know, half the town away, um, 
it actually does encourage people to speed up. It makes it feel like it's a bigger city. So when you bring everything down to the ground level, people go slower. It's a it's a mm. community. It's not just a city you're driving through. Mm -hmm. And so part of their overall plan is to help create this downtown section of Gold Beach where people aren't driving 30, 40, 50 miles an hour like right. they are now, right? like they didn't used to do before. So that's one tiny example of not only did we bring this tax money back in and reinvest and give people jobs and you know create this beautiful thing, we also encouraged another agency to, uh, or we're working with another agency to even more improve. And then uh, AYA has reached out to me and AYA. said, A oh, sorry, yeah, uh, uh, Alternative Youth Associates, I think. Okay. Is, so it's uh, for kids who are struggling with graduating and just kind of struggling with school and I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe have home issues or some behavioral issues at times. And so uh, Scott Cooper is their director. That's in Coos Bay, but they serve Coos and Curry. Um, and, you know, he just reached out to me to say, hey, we might be able to do a work experience program with our, our, our kids, you know, our oh. teens and contribute labor and we'll pay them. Oh. And so... So we're even more, that allows us to take some of those funds and even further invest them into some more supports and more sustainability for the project. So this one project is not just bringing in 3.2 million, you know, it's going to bring in probably at least another 50, 60, 70,000 um, or, or more through these other projects. And that doesn't even take into consideration how it uplifts. Yeah. The people, right? Like, like, what an opportunity for these teens, too! Wow. Um, and I was, you know, I was asking Adam. I was like, I don't know, is this something we can do? And he's like, Yeah, we have all kinds of things that w we can work with wow. um, these these kids on. Wow. So, and you know, they're not young kids; they're they're about to be adults, and some of them might be. And to be able to give people in our community jobs, working as it, in your organization, yeah. is is important, right? Because where else would they get that? kind of work oh and, and development too like um you know this this is a great opportunity for people to learn about nonprofit uh housing development because that's something that i didn't even know is is not the norm it's usually for-profit housing development even for affordable housing hmm. so uh you know it's great like a lot of the projects you know the the affordable housing projects they're all great but this is really a wonderful project for us because we're a local developer <laughs> and we're a nonprofit. So, you know, we're obviously, we're only in it for the altruist experience. Right. And, uh, and then we get to bring in these, these teens possibly, and we get to work with Gold Beach Main Street. And so uh, it's, it's uplifting to the community, but it's also uplifting to us yeah. uh, and personal for us because this is our yep. community. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, it must feel so good. It, it must feel I, so yeah. good. Yeah. I like to wait until everything's done before I get all like excited and emotional. But I, I, I'm starting to get there. That's I feel it, and definitely the groundbreaking ceremony is going to be a big deal. And let's talk about that, yeah. Because um, so this is your veterans project Correct. in Gold Beach, yes. Um, and groundbreaking. So, so yeah. tell me what all of that is. <laughs> so, so you know, you typically have a groundbreaking ceremony when you're just about to start your construction and. It's kind of a misnomer for us because we've already con started construction. Um, I mean, the community center's got a roof on it. But we really wanted, it's not done, and we wanted the community to get a chance to, first of all, to just come in and see what we're doing. I'm sure there's so many people driving by there just like, what is going on at the yeah. hotel? Yeah. And, you know, we cleared all the brush from the other site. And so we're really, um, you know, they're really going to work up there, I think. Uh, Bobby Bergman, who does the concrete work and... Uh, he's also a vet. Uh, he He's awesome to have on the project, and they're doing such great work up there. But they got that community center together so quick, and wow. it's it's amazing. I can't wait to see it finished with all the stuff in it. But, um, yeah, so... So we've we we've had a lot of people drive by. I know there's a lot of curiosity, and and so part of this is we want people just to be able to kind of get an up close look, touch, walk up to it, ask questions, right. um, and then a part of it is, I I grew up here and I did not understand. I'm still learning so much every every day, every week, every month that we're working on this project. I'm learning more about the barriers to low-income housing, the barriers to housing in general, development in rural communities, which I had a, I had a, um, 
you know, that my upbringing was in development and construction. That's where my my dad owned his own uh, cabinet business. I worked in there probably much younger than I should have. <laughs> but um, so th- I really had a great background in construction. I just didn't know a whole lot about the actual development piece of it. Um, you know, I understood the contracting and the subcontracting. I just didn't understand how development started. So this has been a learning ex- experience for me. But even for people who understand development, how to get this kind of development, how to get affordable housing developments, that's a different, you know, working with the state and working with the federal government on grants and, and these types of loans, it's a totally different ball of wax than a private loan or private construction. So... This has been a, a great learning opportunity for both Adam and I to understand. And and as someone who grew up here and didn't understand, and you know, I I see I can see the same person looking out and saying, you know, we don't want to help we don't want to help people who are using drugs and like they need to go get help and they need to go somewhere else. And then uh, and and they're not looking or pointing at anyone in particular. They have a picture in their mind. Maybe they are. Maybe sometimes they are. But for the most part. When people are talking about that, they have a picture in their mind of who they're talking about. But when the when someone is in front of them who's without housing, that's not usually what they look like. They look like, I mean, our average person here in Curry County that is homeless is 100% there in their 50s or above. Wow. Our statistics for just our, just Peer House, which captures every single person that uses any services of ours, um, just the statistics for, I mean, overall, uh, the the more than 50% of the people that walk in our building are 55 and over. Wow. More than 50% of the people that live on our streets that don't have access to housing, don't have access to shelter, don't have access to even a vehicle often, are over the age of 55. And 30% are over the age of 65. Mm. So it's a, it's a healthy chunk of people on our street that are elderly we don't often have the resources to manage that the way we should. No, I know that it, it, it's to have resources to be able to manage things is just yeah. That's one of that's one of the hard things I know. But the you want people to be able to walk up and see yeah the right yeah so the, so what what I'm hoping to do is kind of give people this connection between the vision they have in their mind and the people that are actually standing in front of them right. because they're the same people. They're the same people, but they look in their brain yeah. in those people's brain. They look different. Right? And I, I realize that there are people out there who are, are using drugs and, and all of that. And we, we help everybody. We, we, anybody who comes in um, who is looking for a, a way forward is who we help. There's nobody that comes into our office that isn't looking for help. That's not a thing. So, because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I just, I really, growing up here, I didn't understand some of those connections. And I can hear it. You know, it wasn't, I didn't say the same things that some of them said, but I can hear it in the way that uh, people question me or people ask me about, you know, the population that we serve or the what the need is in our community. And, you know, sometimes they ask in a, derogatory way but typically people are just curious mm-hmm. and I I can hear that they don't see that connection and I can understand that as somebody who grew up here and who didn't have that connection I was homeless and I didn't have the connection um, that I deserved help so when I left and came back um, with you know when I was on my feet and realized the just what the some of these barriers are to getting resources here um, and I started talking about it People had no clue what I was talking about. Um, and some people still don't. And so what I would really like for this groundbreaking ceremony to be is an opportunity for us to have, you know, I, I'd like to have some staff from the state there. I'd like to have some of my staff there. We have a few veterans that we're currently working with that really are going to benefit from this housing. And so we really want to talk, we want everybody to talk about what, uh, first of all, the technical stuff. What are these grants? What is available through the state? It's very technical. Most of them are not going to understand all of this. I didn't understand all of this, but it needs to be said because then we need to move on and talk about what the need is here. And then we need to talk about, okay, all that technical stuff that just got talked about, what does that mean for Curry? What does that mean in Curry County? And so we, that's where, you know, I'd like Dave and some of my staff to talk about the numbers and 
how we've utilized those funds that, you know, when the when the headline in the pilot says governor signs $246 million into, you know, for rapid rehousing, what, what does that mean? What does that mean in Curry? What does that mean right. to the average person reading that newspaper? Right. And so that's what I'm really hoping at this event is that people will come with curiosity mm -hmm. and that we will be able to meet that with information and that we'll be able to solicit even more questions from them and really give them everything we can give them to connect those dots. Because once they understand uh, how important this funding is, how difficult it is to get, um, and what we've done with it here, I think that we'll actually be able to get a little bit more support. We have pretty decent support, I feel like I, at this point, we don't have a lot of people that, you know, reach out and that are up, upset. Um, I think in the beginning, it was just a, a lot of not understanding mm -hmm. what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. But now that people see what we are doing, it's it's gotten a lot better. We, st we still have, um, you know, our rubs, but for the most part, I feel like our staff have done a really good job of educating people and and also setting great boundaries with the people we're working with so that we're not perpetuating the same cycles. You know, we're we are we're understanding where they're coming from, so we're not contributing to that. And we actually just had that conversation today in our staff meeting about some of our folks, you know, most people who've experienced chronic homelessness and trauma will reject people before they're rejected as a way of maintaining that power. We all do it. Yep. It's just we don't have to do it as much as people who are out there who are subject to being rejected all the time. Every day. Every day. Yeah. So if you're subject to that every day and you've been out there for 10, 20 years, it's just automatic for you to reject people. And sometimes you do it in a nasty way because you're just so tired of people um, you're just, being you just, mean to you. You're just tired of other people feeling like they have a right to yeah. be mean to you. Right. Because they don't. Right. Um, but people do feel entitled to speak their mind to somebody who's homeless. They feel entitled to ask questions to somebody who's, because they're visible and they're there. Yep. And so their their way of responding to that, most of, most, not them, most of us as humans, our way of responding to that is we reject first. Yep. And if you're in a cycle where you're constantly rejected, it's going to be a, a constant habit for you. So we were talking about that today um, about some of our clients, um, when they do get upset with us, you know, they reject us because they anticipate us rejecting them, even though we, we don't. And it takes such a long time to get them to trust us sometimes, depending on how long they've been out there, how much trauma they've experienced. Um, so these are all like things that we, we work really hard to understand as an agency and as individual people within the agency so that we can set clear boundaries that aren't mean but that are that make sense that that are healthy for everybody involved. Um, so you know we don't if it's like they reject us and they get mad and they say f you and they walk out. That's not like you know we're not acting on that and saying okay well they can't come back for that. We're saying we understand where they're coming from and when they come back we'll, we're going to talk to them and see where they're at. We understand that that's not how everybody in the community can operate, but that's our job. So. Because I love of that, that, Diana. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I mean, everybody it, needs somebody. Exactly. And, that, you know, and immediately, you know, my thinking goes to my dog that I rescued mm -hmm. or I adopted from, you know, that had been rescued. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, she was suspicious because she had had right. a hard time and it took a long time to get over that. I mean, of course... That's what we right. as humans do. Well, and we we understand that when it comes to animals, especially right. dogs. Right. In this community, we totally understand that yes. about dogs. Yes. There is a huge love for animals in this community. And I see it all the time. I mean, when South Coast Humane Society posts stuff, I see all the love on those yep. posts. And it's wonderful. Yes. We don't extend that same grace to humans because we think that they have logic and reason. But we don't understand that when people are going through trauma, they are not in their logic brain. They are in their survival brain, just like animals, because we're animals. Yes. And so we can have reason all day long and lose it. Yes. <laughs> and and we don't get grace when we lose it. And right. and I understand that sometimes when we lose when we lose that, um, we can cause harm, we can create all kinds of havoc for people. And I we do believe in 
natural consequences, not because we think people should have bad things happen to them, but because we understand that we we can't save people and it would be futile for us to try. So sometimes natural consequences happen to the people that we're serving and we come alongside them. We, we can't save them, but we come alongside them. And we're just there to say, like, we're just here. We can't fix it, but we are here. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's not good enough. And we understand that, too. We accept that. But sometimes that's all they need mm-hmm. because everybody needs someone that yep. they can flip out on and still talk to the next day. Yep. And we... We have good boundaries. We keep our staff safe. And sometimes we switch someone to another case manager because it's just, it's not a good therapeutic relationship. But at the end of the day, sometimes we're just the only person they have. And this, we get paid to do this. We are going home, sleeping in a bed. We are getting a paycheck. That doesn't make it easy. No. But that makes it easier to swallow that pill. Right. So, uh, so these are all, these are all things that we've, that's just part of our fabric of core and everybody in the agency believes this wholeheartedly. And so that enables us to be confident when we're talking with the public and when we're talking with other people. And I think that's enabled us to make a lot of progress in the community. Um, And there's no, I mean, all of us as agencies are trying our best to make progress and we're all making progress in different ways. This is our progress. This is how we're we're doing it. So tell me a little bit about um, the groundbreaking ceremony. So when, when is it? So it'll be next Friday. My gosh, it's Friday. It'll be next Friday. (laughs) We're recording this on Friday, so I'm panicking. Um, It's next Friday. Uh, It'll be November, November 8th. 8th. Right. Which is the Friday before Veterans Day. Um, we we planned it. It's beautiful because we really uh, we really wanted to highlight and honor mm-hmm. um, the the work that uh, I mean all the sacrifice that veterans have made in our especially the ones in our community that yep. we know and see every day. Um, so this is kind of a special project for some of us. And Dave, who's who's our housing programs manager, he is a vet and he works. He's been working with homeless vets in our community for I mean seven eight years. Wow. So he's he actually was the one that named this, mm. um, and uh, I I did have a hand in it, but he pretty much named it. So this is we'll be meeting at about three o'clock. We ha- we will have tents, large tents and chairs set up because it's not supposed to rain until six, and we'll be done at five. But that way everybody's comfortable and there's no issue. And it's in Gold Beach. It is in Gold Beach. So where? the the address, if anybody knows where Wild Chinook Inn is, that's where it's at. But it's 94200 Harlow Street. Um, it is right behind Ace Hardware. So if you turn at Ace Hardware, uh, you'll be able to, you'll you'll see all of the cars. And um, we don't have a ton of parking right now. So that kind of is an issue. I think if people park at the actual park just behind the project, they'll probably have a lot easier time. Um, that's one of the issues is there's not a lot of downtown parking mm-hmm. um, in Gold Beach. Right. And we're actually going to be developing that lot across the street as a parking lot. We don't need the parking spaces. Um, obviously, they'll be able to, you know, the tenants will be able to use those spaces, but they have their own spaces. Right. And so we don't anticipate needing very much. So we're actually building that parking lot to hopefully create a little bit of additional parking in downtown Gold Beach for Ace Hardware and other businesses nearby. Nice. Yeah. Way to so, go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was it was just wonderful that that parcel across the street was included in the sale wow. and that we, you know, there's even a flat space behind that we can develop more housing on later. Wow. So it's wonderful that all of that came together the way it did and we're able to use such a large portion of it for the community. Love that. Um, yeah. And so November 8th. November 8th Friday. from 3 to 5. 3 to 5. Okay. Uh, we'll have several speakers there. Mm-hmm. I think so I'll be speaking obviously. Dave will be speaking. I think we'll have one of our clients who's, you know, really excited about the project um, is going to be talking. Uh, I believe Tammy Mayor Kaufman mm-hmm. uh, will be speaking and then with all luck, we'll have someone from the state through Oregon Housing Community Services that can talk about all these grants. And then Adam will be talking on the and development Adam piece. is your... Adam is my... He's my right-hand man here. <laughs> Adam Briggs from AB Innovations. So he has done everything from... He worked with me on the grant um, a year ago. I guess it was a year ago. Yeah, it was October. Um, Well, we submitted in October of 2023, and we heard back in October. So right about this time of the year is when we heard that we were getting it. 
So he worked with me on the grant. Uh, he is a um, general contractor. So he's doing all of the general contract work, uh, which is awesome. And then he is a property manager. So he'll be training my staff internally on how to do property right. management for the first right. year so that we can do that internally, which right. gives us the flexibility to say, oh, someone missed rent. Let's bring in the housing team to pay their rent and work with them on the issue instead of eviction notice, you know? Yeah. So Beautiful. it's so wonderful for us to own this project and have our own case management available. Mm -hmm. um, we're really excited about that. So he's going to be training us on how to do that. He's done property management. Um, and then he's also a licensed realtor. So he was the one that helped. He was our realtor for the project and all of our other projects. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, he's he's not going anywhere. Yeah, I don't know if he goodness. knows that. But. <laughs> Just gonna have to have him sign a contract. <laughs> we we joke about KCIW being the the python that wraps itself yeah. right or devours yep, yep. you. It's like uh, obviously Core's doing the same yep, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he made the mistake of finding me and wanting go. to work with me, and I don't think he regrets it. <laughs> no, no, I've met him. He seems like a very nice oh, it's human awesome. Guy. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your new office, Pierre yeah. House Navigation Center. It's yeah. Let's talk. I mean, about talk about that. lovely. That's it's and you've beautiful. been in there, yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah, that's it's now. We had our open house back in August, and we we would have waited to have the open house till everything was complete and finished. But we we were losing Steve, and we really wanted him to be included. This he's been such a huge part of this organization. Um, Still sad that he's gone, even though I'm happy for him. We're, there's still moments where I, you know, get a little choked up. But his face comes up on Facebook. I see yeah, a lot. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like oh, Steve. We all were just talking about him today. I actually texted him yesterday, so it's kind of ironic. But um, yeah, so so we had our open house back in August, and then we there was still some work, the fencing that needed to be done, and the plumbing, and we really just couldn't open without the plumbing, obviously. Nope. Um, that was complete, and we were able to open. I guess it's been a month, maybe not, maybe not quite. I honestly can't remember. I think it's been no a month. No more than a month. No, no, definitely not. Right. Uh, it must have been maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. So, so we've been open for about that long. Uh, we had, yeah, the inside is. I mean, so you walk inside, and it's kind of split into two sections, which it was actually two different houses that were put together. So it's kind of funny oh, that we have it split that way. Yeah. So when you walk in, if you go to the right, uh, well, you'll hit a locked door. But beyond that is our um, health programs. So we've got our our resource navigators back there, and then we have our clinic room that is not a functioning clinic yet, but it it's functional. We just ha I don't have it open as a clinic with a provider, um, and then we have. Um, you know, our, our staff bathroom and, and kitchen. And then if you go to the left, we've got a couple of rooms for um, staff. And then it opens up into a big uh, day center, essentially. Uh, and most day centers are for mental health and like they're like clubhouses. And so mm -hmm. you just have to have some mental health diagnosis and, and you can go in and use the facilities. Ours is slightly different. It is for homelessness. So Instead of like some kind of verification of, of a mental health, you just need some kind of verification of homelessness, which for us is word of mouth. You know, if you right. tell us that you're without housing, uh, that's we, we do we do an intake and we do some vetting. But for the, essentially, um, it is for people who are without shelter. So once they get into housing or shelter, we do phase them out of those services because it's really for the most it's for people who don't have anywhere to go. Right. So there's a clothing closet. There's desk space, couches. We've got a table in there with a puzzle that I guess they just completed. So they got to get a new puzzle. Oh, it was like, yeah, I know. I, saw, I know. I love puzzles. Honestly, it's so nice to just like, to just go in and see a couple of people doing a puzzle because it's such a normal thing. Yeah. It's so, it's just such a menial, normal thing that, you know, usually when you're, when you're homeless and you're in an agency, you have to be, you're like you're doing something you're engaging in something you're working right. on something right. but to see people just sitting and being yeah you know is like that for me in a place is, where it's really okay for them to yes be who they this are. has been the yeah. culmination of so many years of work having this day center wow. is has been this has been the goal from day one so it's that that's why that open house you know it was so important to have Steve there this was for us that open mm -hmm. house was for us and our yeah. clients it was our celebration of like we did this and we created this safe space now. 
in in the whole county we we have a space that we know is safe hmm. so God, that's um great yeah so they they've got their own like little kitchen area clothing closet we've got hygiene stuff the, um we've I, we were t- i think that they're even doing like you know little crock pot meals and things so people can oh, come in and have great. something to eat so we're just trying to figure out what all you know we'll have a shower trailer project next year um with laundry facilities and bathroom extra bathrooms we'll never have enough bathrooms no um and then we'll have um we're also looking to odot they've got several micro grants that um are very easy to get and i think next year we'll be implementing a um bike repair station really so people can wow. yeah because that a lot of times if they have any transportation at all it's a bicycle we've got a lot of folks who have bikes and it would be also great to um kind of we were also talking at one point about having them they could bring bikes fix them up and sell them or Mm -hmm. you know we can bring bikes fix them up and give them away to Mm -hmm. our clients and so there's a lot of potential there Uh, we're talking about different kind of work experience programs we can run on there we're going to have a community garden for the for our members Mm -hmm. so that's the that's peer house so peer house has a membership application that we do and it's just a screening to make sure that we're really serving the people that need it and once you're a member you're able to use the facility you'll be a part of the um, planning for any of the projects we do in fact all of the the paint and a lot of the interior for peer house was planned with our participants and not us so um, that's why I it's so cool that. looking because all the colors they picked out and <laughs> yeah. just, I mean, Kathleen kind of did all the final stuff, but they really picked out like the scheme and the, what they wanted it to feel like. Mm-hmm. So it feels like that for sure. So it's kind of, I mean, it's their space. Yeah. That's why it's called Peer House. It's yeah. it's a house for our peers. Nice. And, and we can't give them, we can't give them a bed, but we can give them something, we can give them a house that, you know, you would do your normal daily stuff. Right. You know, somewhere where you have... A bathroom nearby where you've got a kitchen nearby. You've got internet and a phone. And and if you can go there every day, mm-hmm. if you can just have a few hours mm-hmm. where you have a roof over your and, head. And you and know you bathroom, can be there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, that's, that's And they're allowed lot. to be there the entire time we're open. Mm-hmm. We don't have a, you know, you can only be here for two hours. Mm-hmm. You know, I assume once we get, like, we're looking to get a desktop and printer and all that. So there's probably going to be time limits on certain things. Mm-hmm. But if they're if they're there to hang out for the day, they they can be there the whole time we're open. So, yeah. So it really is like, um, and I know you know that's kind of how it is at St. Timothy's too. Is there's no time limit. There's a time limit on showers and whatnot. But right. And that's really what people need is give them the parameters and then give them the freedom to do what they need to do in those parameters. Yeah. And most people will come out on the other side of that successful without intervention. Right. Um, but we're there just in case, mm-hmm. in case they need someone to fall back on mm-hmm. oh that's excellent yeah i can't wait to have more peers at peer house i know kathleen is just it's been so long she's been doing this solo and she's had volunteers she has some staffing help here and there but she's just never had dedicated staff for peer house and that is one of our most uh well all the programs are important yeah of course. but that is our doorway program right, to everything right. so so are you looking at hiring more staff well the measure 110 funding is renewing uh, in July 1st of 2025, we, we've we submitted our request for renewal, which includes an increase so that we can hire two more dedicated peers. Okay. Actually, it would be three full-time peers and Kathleen. So she would actually have three staff. Wow. Uh, two of those would likely manage the shower trailer project. So they would only be on site three days a week and they'd be mm-hmm. off site two days. And then the other peer would be just dedicated to peer house. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So good. Uh, but we do have like a, we do have someone who's helping her part time right now. But that person also has other responsibilities. Mm-hmm. So, are you looking for volunteers? We are. We do have um, some really great volunteers right now. But one of them, I think, will be actually taking a position with us soon because that happens pretty much every time we have a volunteer, we hire them. So wow. for FYI, for anyone looking to work with us, mm-hmm. uh, not only are we hiring like five positions this year in the next few months, but we also we frequently, almost always, uh, pull from our volunteer pool because, you know, unless we have an applicant that just is just way qualified and blows us out of the water, um, usually everybody's very equally qualified. And somebody who's been volunteering and knows us and knows our staff, of course, you know, of course, we want to bring them in and right. make room for more people. So 
So if you're looking to work for us in the future, even if it's not right now, if you come down and volunteer and you can come down to our building, it's 16389 Highway 101. It is the old Calor Insurance Building for anybody who is aware. Yeah. yeah, Sunshine Cove is the, the street. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to, you can just come out there and ask. Uh, and Kathleen is who you would want to talk to. Um, and you can start volunteering anytime. And then when we have open positions, you know, usually our volunteers are the first to hear about it because we're talking about it there. So, yeah, so that'd be great. Um, I know she's got some really great ones right now, so I don't know what her need is, but we're always looking for good folks yeah, of course. to bring in. Yeah, of course. We're always yeah. looking to chain people to us. <laughs> I love it. So tell our listeners how to get in touch with you. You have a website. You yeah. have, yeah. So our website is... Uh, www.brookingscoreresponse.org and we've got a lot of links on there. We're trying to get everything up to date. Uh, we've got quite a bit of it up to date, but I think we need to sort of revamp some of our program information. But you can go on there. There is a, a link there. You can reach out to us through our contact there. We've got our, our phone number 541-251-0825. Um, if anybody's looking for, you know, we we also are willing to do um, show people around and, you know, to our various projects. Some of the projects we can't show our people around and some of them we can only show during certain times, you know, because it's not a petting zoo and we, we're not right. showing off our clientele. Right. Um, but if people are wanting to see that space, they would want to reach out to us instead of going in. Mm -hmm. um, just general community members, if you go into Peer House, you likely won't get shown around to anything um, just because it, we want to keep confidentiality. But I'm I'm available to answer questions too. So if you call that number, you can ask for me and um, leave me a message or whatnot. So um, we still have our admin office over at the shopping center, but it typically the the front door is open, but there's no reception there now. So it's usually people just coming in for appointments. Okay. But if somebody wanted to come in and donate or ask about a tour, they could come into that admin office, mm -hmm. and that'd be a quick way to get us. Is that generally where you are? <laughs> Well, where I, are you? Where is <laughs> we're in the world, right? That's yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I, when I said, "Oh, I I won't be in. I don't think I'll be in on Monday. I'll be here Tuesday." I told Liz, and she said, "I we work over here. I would never know anyway." Exactly. So most of the time, Maybe I you'll be there. Yeah, most of the time, I actually do work remotely now, just because there's not so much the need for. Right. They don't need me as much. And basically, you're writing grants. So yeah, but yeah. I am there sometimes. Our admin staff is in the office, and our housing staff. So. If somebody right. did walk in, they, they'd they right. catch someone important, sure. Good. Yeah, probably more important than me. I don't, <laughs> someone that knows more answers than me, I'm sure. Diana, we're almost out of time. Oh, I know. Look at that. I know. How did that happen? Again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a reminder, see people up in Gold Beach uh, on Friday, the 8th of November from 3 to 5 for the groundbreaking ceremony for the Veterans Project, which I am thrilled mm. about. Um, and the address up there again? 94200 Harlow Street, and it's right behind Ace Hardware in Gold Beach. So, Diana, thanks for taking the time to come yeah. and be on the show. I love having you here. It's yeah, I'm so glad that it came, was able to come in and do yeah, this today. Yeah, me too. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Another winter brings all kinds of challenges for those in our community who are already having challenges. Help out if you can. Until next time, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. <music> <music>